Welcome, listeners and viewers, to an amazing next live episode of the Hidden History Happy Hour. We are once again coming to you live on tape uh, from the Von Bar. Now, if you haven't been to the Von Bar, we are sitting in the heart of the Bowery in Gotham City, in New York City. And this bar is not only my favorite bar in Manhattan. Mine too. And Alex's favorite bar in Manhattan. And near it's yours too, right? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. We are going to tell you about the most amazing World War II escape story you've never heard. And the reason I know you've never heard it is my friend right here of 25, 30 years near Yarden and his family who are here. It's about his father, their grandfather. I won't even begin to hint at how much this guy escaped from how much. First, my man Alex Dean, my partner, is going to tell us the story of the Georgian uprising. Because one... It's going to lead directly into Nier's story. Two, it's from Alex's amazing book, Lessons from History, which is available in the United States of America now. <laughs> Alex, tell us about the Georgian Uprising. Uh, the Georgian Uprising took place on the Dutch island of Texel, which is spelled Texel. I've been mispronouncing it for years until I um, asked some Dutch people about it. And I knew about this because... Um, those of you in the room may have gathered, I like a beer. And <laughs> Texel, Texel produces some of the finest beer in the world. You may have had some. It's a small island. It's got an enormous brewery. And they produce a huge amount of beer. And they export half of it. They drink the rest on the island. My kind of people. That math is impressive. Yeah, But uh, back in the day, uh, it had a rather sadder uh, story. During the Second World War, the Wehrmacht had a Georgian legion. They had a group of men who had been uh, offered the opportunity to fight uh, for the Third Reich. And they were offered the opportunity in this way. Some of them had fled westwards uh, from the uh, violence happening in their country, which is beautiful, by the way. And met rather more of them were captured Georgian soldiers. And all of them were asked this, would you like to go to the camps, uh, with all that that entailed, or would you choose to sign up with the Wehrmacht? Would you like to come and, uh, with all the rations and perks that, it, that that would bring with it and the likelihood of surviving? Could you have options? War? So what would you have done? You, of course, would have, uh, have said, I'll, I'll sign up with you, which is what these, German, uh, these Georgians did. And they were posted, this Georgian legion, they're called the Queen Tamar Battalion, the Queen Tamar uh, Legion, which was, for them, immensely insulting because it was the name of a Georgian queen from one of the times when they weren't repressed by their neighbours. So they found even the name pretty reprehensible. But they were posted to this far-flung outpost in the Netherlands on a Frisian island in order to build part of what was the, uh, and maintain and defend the Atlantic Wall, the, the attempt to rebuff uh, what uh, the Allies were going to do uh, on D-Day and after D-Day. And we remember um, the, the recent anniversary of D-Day as we tell uh, this story. Then at the very end of the war, the end of the Second World War, it's plain that the Germans have lost. The Georgian Legion are ordered by the Wehrmacht to go to the front. They didn't really fancy that. <laughs> they thought to themselves, I don't think that's a very good idea. So overnight... The 5th to the 6th of April 1945, the Georgians rose up and knifed many of their Wehrmacht colleagues uh, to death in their beds. And with the gallant assistance of the Dutch resistance on the island, took over the island of Tessel. And it took the Germans more than a month to take the island back uh, from these guys. And after the Germans had restored uh, quasi-order, bear in mind, a month after April, we are right at the, the end of the, the Second World War. It's one of the last battles fought in the entirety of the Second World War. After it, the Dutch hide these Georgians everywhere on this tiny island. They're in ditches, they're in attics, they're in hidden rooms behind fake walls. They, they, they manage to hide hundreds of these Georgians um, until the close of the war. And when the war ends... The Western Allies, in accordance with the agreement that we had with the Russians, sent them to back to Stalin. Ugh. And their fate was not a happy one. But it's not a straightforward story. And one of the reasons I, I'm always interested in this story is that it's told differently by everyone that took part right. in it. 
For the Georgians, it was a tale of the resistance that they uh, offered at the last opportunity when they took the chance against the Germans. For the Dutch, who had a terrible war in many ways and were a terrible reputation of collaboration for many of them, and the most famous story to come out of the Netherlands, Anne Frank story, it was an opportunity to point to something brave that they did, and, and it, they, the Dutch held it up as a tremendous example of their uh, resistance and, uh, and help um, for the Allies. The Russians wholly adopted uh, the, the story of this and pretended that the Georgians had been prisoners of war fighting for Mother Russia, made a, a cinema movie, uh, made a, a cinematic movie about it, which they insisted on playing uh, to the, uh, Soviet, the captive Soviet population. It became an enormously popular film, completely fictitious. They do know their propaganda. They, they were excellent at propaganda. Uh, and until the fall of the Soviet Union, the ambassador to the Netherlands from, uh, uh, from Russia would go every year to commemorate this fictitious idea that they were brave Russian prisoners of war. They were neither prisoners of war nor Russian, uh, but they maintained... Other than that. that. Other than that was spot on. The Canadians who, who turned up, to, they thought, the Canadians thought they were arriving uh, just to take over from a quelled bunch of, uh, of dispirited uh, Germans. Oh, what the... <laughs> they found, found hundreds of Germans who'd been knifed in their beds. They found uh, Georgians popping out of closets and uh, coming out of polder ditches and uh, who just you know, celebrating wildly. The Canadians thought it was one of the weirdest experiences of, uh, of the war. And the Germans, of course, didn't want to talk about it right. at all. For each of the groups that were... I mean, if, there, the other part of the reason it's not a straightforward story is that some of those Germans will have been unwilling conscripts, would have been boys forced to fight for the Wehrmacht, knifed to death in their sleep by people they thought were their allies. And some of those Georgians... They, they were suffering the same fate as yeah. the people that knifed them. Yeah, and yeah. But, then, but then a few of those Georgians will have likely been willing collaborators with the Nazis. So it's, it's not a straightforward story at all. But what lesson do I draw from it? Uh, there's a little homily in, in, in the book. What lesson do I draw from it? I think if you force somebody into a situation in the first place, you can hardly expect them to cleave to the terms and conditions that they signed up to. That's my story. Great story. Thank you so much for telling it. A couple things about this. One is, it's obviously timely. We're in 2022. The Russians have an unprovoked, unjustified war criminal uh, invasion. It, Probably could add a few more adjectives there, but, you know, we're a family show. Although you just said fuck, so I might as well. Um, and, and, but th this is going to play out in the future, right? Sooner or later, the Russia-Ukraine conflict is going to end, and we all, I think, desperately hope with the Ukrainian victory. <clears throat> and there's going to be recriminations and variable storytelling on all sides, Except for this difference, Alex, which we've talked about before. So much of this war is now on video. And welcome to Chitra Raghavan and her crew. I was on, we were on her podcast the other day. Welcome. She has a podcast called uh, Techtopia, where we talked a lot about and subscribe to it at, right after you subscribed to ours, um, where we talk about the way that technology is going to influence history in, in 100, 200, 500 years. So it's very relevant. <clears throat> but I think more importantly, or at least more poignantly for me, one of the strengths of many of the best stories from Lessons from History is that they're personal. We're not telling the story of the war in the Pacific. We're telling the story of a sailor in the Pacific. I mean, we're not actually telling that, but you might in volume two. We're not telling the story of everyone who was ever captured by pirates. We're telling the story of when Julius Caesar was captured by pirates. And... As great as those stories are, they're great because they're personal, but rarely, if ever on our podcast to date, do we get to hear a personal story from a person who actually lived it or who is an immediate descendant. And tonight we are so fortunate to have a story that I don't believe has ever been told in public about the most amazing World War II escapes you've never heard of, told by the son of the man who lived it, Paul Yarden. Welcome, my friend, Near Yarden. Thank you, guys. Woo. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Brian and Alex, for having me tonight. Oh, our pleasure. Tell us about your dad. Yeah, let me just preface my remarks. Brian said we've been friends for 25 years. Brian and I met in 1988, and I'm no Albert Einstein, but that's about 34 years. So... That kind of, in a nutshell, yeah. tells you everything about our relationship. He I tries agree to with minimize you. it. <laughs> you know, I, I agree with you a thousand and ten percent. This is a story that involves um, Nazis and fascists and communists and post-war Britain 
and uh, tragedy and sadness. Um, but at its heart, and what I think gives it its universal, universal that we can all relate to feeling is um, a sense of a will to live and survive as experienced by this teenage boy who happens to be my father. In the end, it's a triumph story. And a triumph, yeah. yeah, I think so. I think so. So um, I hope we discuss a, a number of events occur throughout his experience in World War II that I think still have uh, important impact today as it relates to Ukraine and stuff. So I yeah. really hope we can kind of discuss some of those issues. So quick background. My father is uh, named Paul Yarden. Um, actually, his, his name was Pavel Yarden. He's born in a small town in what now is southern Slovakia. Um, at the time, it was part of Czechoslovakia. He's born in 1927, November 1927. Um, and in order to understand kind of the events and how they impact his life, uh, it's a little bit important to understand the geopolitical issues that are going on that, at least with respect to the Hungarians, are still going on today mm. and are impacting how they're relating to the Russian-Ukrainian uh, issue. If you think about uh, what is now Slovakia and cut off a third of the bottom and go from east to west, that section of Slovakia used to be, uh, during World War I and pre that time, part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire and associated with Hungary. So, Nir, let me just interject there that when you talk about taking a country and cutting off the bottom third of it and moving it, that's pretty much what the Brits and the Americans did for about 400 well, years, which has always worked right. out well for us. Right, and that part, by the way, just to give you a little bit of preview of what's going on here, goes from the Austrian-Hungary Empire, which is ruled by empires, czars, kings, and queens, and is blown out of existence from World War I, to a liberal Czech Democratic Republic until 1938. It then switches to a fascist-aligned Nazi Hungarian uh, society and then a nation and then switches finally to the communists. So you go from kings and queens, liberal democratic empire, Nazi, fascist, communism, all in a span of 25 years. So put that in perspective when people talk about political instability going from Democrat to Republican or Labor to Tory, what have you. Um, I'm tempted to say it reminds us of our last 10 years in America, but I get that it is way more extreme, and that's an excellent point. He's, uh, he's born in 1927 to a family, a um, father named William of note. His father's an officer in the Hung Hungarian-Austrian army, captured by the Russians after world, sent in World War I to a Siberian camp, and then makes his way back to that part of Hungary. In 1920, as a result of World War I, the Allies' forces... Um, sort of cut up Hungary, and, it, and, and it's what's known as the Treaty of Trian. And effectively what they do is they, well, they cut Hungary to pieces. Hungary goes from a nation of 21 million to about 8 million people. It loses about 70% of its territorial rights. That portion that I talked about, that third of what is Hungary, is given over to this new country that's formed in the middle of Europe called Czechoslovakia. It's worked out well for us in the Middle East, too, that kind of... Yeah, that that approach, exactly, yeah. exactly. Czechoslovakia is made up of a weird assortment of, of different people combined together that frankly don't particularly like each other. You've got Czechs, Slovaks, Germans in Sudetenland, and Hungarians in this part of, of what is southern um, Slovakia. Um, the, the government there is Thomas is, uh, Mazurki. I think that's the way you pronounce his name. Anyway, Liberal Democrats... His life, he, he, his life is, is, is a fairly good one until about 1938. You're talking um, about your dad now. Dad, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a rural area, um, and he has a younger brother named Jan. His parents, even though they're Hungarian and they speak Hungarian, um, name them Slovakian names. So his, his name is Pavel, Paul. I'll call him Paul for purposes of this discussion. And then his brother is named Jan. His mother is Adele. She comes from Hungary. And he has two characteristics, two features that as you hear the story unfold, will serve him invaluably to survive. One is hereditary. He's born with blonde hair and blue eyes, kind of stocky. So if you see Paul walking down the street as, as a teenager, you're not going to think this is a Jew. You say this is a typical Slovakian. He right. combs his hair straight back, blonde hair, kind of broad features. The second issue, or the second benefit he gets, he actually gets from his mother. At a very young age, he shows a tremendous talent with languages. And, and um, if you think about that area of the world, 
where you've got Hungarians and Slovakians and Polish and Ukrainians and Romanians all kind of slammed together as World War II unfolds and even afterwards, um, the ability to know different languages and work your way through it becomes critical to survive uh, as, as the war unfolds. So he, he, aside from Hungarian, he, he has a basic understanding of Slovakian. He learns German uh, and even a little bit of Yiddish and a little bit even of English, some words listening to the BBC. And, and the family lives a fairly prosperous life. The father comes back, his father, he starts a lumber business there uh, and, and does quite well for himself. He but, but let's not lose this, this fact to the myths yeah. of history. I believe you said, which I didn't know until this telling of the story, his father escaped from a Russian camp. Yeah. Yeah. In right. Siberia. Yeah. yeah. And so he has that in his DNA. Yeah, yeah, his, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, officer in World War I. 1938 really changes the complexion of Europe altogether. Um, what happens at that point is the Munich Accord, where Hitler, um, meeting with the British, Neville Chamberlain, uh, are successful in taking over Sudetenland. And as part of the philosophy of the Nazis, um, decide, called Lieberstrom, they will now meet their manifest destination and, and start pushing east, eventually to take over the Slavic people, uh, to, to serve the greater Germanic nation. And so the, the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia that my father gets caught up in goes through stages. The first stage is um, that famous uh, piece in our time where, where, yeah. where and, and, and For the record, Churchill was against that all along. Well, he has one of the greatest quotes ever. So never, the, the background is never, Neville Chamberlain comes to Germany, they negotiate it. The, the Germans are successful in taking over Sudetenland, which is three million ethnic Germans. Without a shot. Without a shot, exactly. Neville Chamberlain goes back to England, waves this peace treaty in the air and says, peace in our time, yeah. right, forever. To which Chamberlain has one of the greatest retorts. Churchill, you mean. Churchill, excuse yeah. me. Um, and, and, and he says, um, you, sir, could have picked between war and dishonor. You pick dishonor, and now we're going to have war, which is exactly how it unfolds. Mm -hmm. Hitler and Ribbentrop, who are um, Hitler's foreign minister, they don't stop there. They now view all of Czechoslovakia as a place to go after. And so a series of events occur that directly impact Paul. First of all, that third of, of what is now Slovakia resorts back to Hungary. So it's called the, the First Vienna Award. And basically the, what the Nazis are trying to do is align up the various groups in Eastern Europe before they shoot a single mm -hmm. one. So suddenly his family goes from living in this liberal Czech Republic environment into an environment that is aligned with Germany. Um, the, second, this, the, the second thing that occurs is Slovakia, led by a, a fascist named Joseph Tito, comes into existence. Good vodka, terrible a, leader. Yeah, well, exactly. With the backing of the Germans, the Hungarians then move into Transcarpathia. Uh, excuse me, the Hungarians move into Transcarpathia, which now is part of Ukraine. So if you know the Carpathian Mountains in their shape, um, they take over that. Um, and so if you think about the Carpathian Mountains, think about a horseshoe that runs from Slovakia through southern Poland, Ukraine, into Romania. And so the Hungarian forces suddenly, with the creation of Slovakia, decide they're going to make this land grab. Um, and then ultimately Transylvania is given to Hungary as well by the, by the Nazis. Why is that relevant? Two factors. One is Slovakia is now ruled by a guy by the name of jo Joseph Tiso, who is so rabidly anti-Semitic, I think certain Nazis would blush at it. Huh, Deportation of Jews in Slovakia starts. And what that does is it buy, it, it, it's it, unintended consequences. It buys my father some critical time. Because had that sliver of, of what was then Czechoslovakia stayed in Slovakia, for sure his family would have perished in 1942. Something like 95% of Slovakian Jews are sent to the death camps in, in, in southern Poland. But so someone draws a line on the map and his family survives. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and because the Germans are appealing to the Hungarians. They're saying, look, we know you're enraged that all these territories are taken away from you. The way we're going to align is start giving you back this mm -hmm. stuff. The second issue is because the Transcarpathian Mountains are grabbed by the Hungarians, they will then be forced to defend that mountain range in 1944 when the Russians start making their move. 
And ultimately, that's where my father will wind up in the war. Um, and how old is he in 44? He 27. He's uh, 16. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the, in 33 to 44, the hammer starts coming down on Jews in Hungary. What Hungary does is they start implementing all sorts of laws against Jews modeled on the Nuremberg Laws in Germany. So step by step, the Jews in Hungary are stripped of all rights. They can't, they're, they're, they can't take certain professions. They can't intermarry. Um, and, and they're limited in terms of what, they're, what they can even go into. And for, for our, <clears throat> our younger viewers, the uh, Nuremberg Laws were a bunch of laws passed in Germany that systematically stripped Jews of all their rights, economic, personal, political, yeah. business rights. Yeah, it's... it's uh, and laid the basis for the Holocaust. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, one of the interesting things, talking to two lawyers to my right here, is <laughs> it's amazing how quickly a state can take an individual that has all the rights and strip it away to the point where they literally have less rights than cattle yeah. or horses. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this is in case. In fact, what I would say is many farmers throughout history have treated their animals much kinder than ultimately what would happen to the Jews yeah. in that area. Um, his school in, in this town, Tornal, is shut down. And he has to wind up going to a school, a Jewish school in Debrecen, which is the second largest city in Hungary, close to the Romanian border. Now, things are bad for the Jews. And one thing he's noticing, when he takes train rides back and forth from Debrecen home to Tornola, the Jews are starting to get subjected to all sorts of uh, bad acts. So, for example, he's on a train heading home. Uh, Hungarian guards come in and say, all the Jews off the train. And he, and he keeps his mouth shut. He doesn't say anything. And he realized, he starts getting street smart about the conditions and the Jews and how to sort of avoid, at a very young age now, he, he goes to Debrecen in 1939. So at that point, he's 12 years old, huh. and he's there until 44. Mm -hmm. But he's starting to see the persecution of Jews around him. The Orthodox Jews are getting beat up kind of visibly in the streets and stuff. And so he has to develop a certain street, street smarts being alone um, in that setting. Now, things are bad for the Jews, but not as bad as the surrounding countries. What happens in Hungary is Hungary is slow to adopt this notion of we're going to start shipping all the Jews here into the concentration camps, um, notwithstanding all their anti-Semitic policies. And the population of Jews in Hungary starts to swell uh, to the point where there are about 800,000 Jews left in 1944. Everywhere else around them, the Holocaust is in full about, you know, Jew, Jewish populations are getting decimated. The population is swelling for two reasons. One is Jews are escaping from other countries, and, and in that part of the world, the only place that they're safe is Hungary. Safe-ish, yeah. So, yeah, safe-ish, exactly, exactly. The second thing is these crazy Nuremberg laws, who constitutes a Jew, starts to get the ranks, yeah. as you know, right? So, yeah. you know, let's just say you have a grandparent who's a Jew. Suddenly, under Hungarian law, you're a Jew. And for purposes of their laws. So the conditions are real bad, really yeah. bad. But they don't turn catastrophic until the Germans decide they're going to invade Hungary in 1944. And the reason is, is that many countries now in Eastern Europe are trying to figure out how the hell they can get away from the Germans. At this point, the Russians are making their move. They see the writings on the wall. Horthy, who is a, a fascist line guy, starts to turn. The Germans get nervous that the Hungarians are leaving their orbit, and they decide to invade Hungary. Hungary also plays a very important role in two respects to the German war machine. One is Romania has the oil, Hungary has the refineries. Those are the countries that are feeding the German war machine. Um, the second thing is, uh, we talked about the Carpathian Mountain and the layout, Hungary proves to be a very important battleground center. It's very flat. And so for the big Panzer and T-34 battles, that becomes a central location. So they can't lose Hungary as a defense as the Russians are pushing forward. Much, much like in 2022, the Russian offensive onto Kiev and the western parts of Ukraine stuttered. They're doing better in the eastern part where it's flat and they can employ their tanks and exactly. artillery. Yeah. Exactly. So the Germans move in. I think the, his official title is Ober von Strom Fuhrer Adolf Eichmann is sent by Hitler and the senior officials... Adolf Eichmann, the architect of the Holocaust. Oh, the Holocaust is sent with explicit instructions. Go to Hungary as part of our invading force. 
organize these goddamn Hungarians and get rid of these Jews once and for all, right, by Hitler and his guys. We don't know why these, and this is 1944. We're not talking about 41, 42. The war is, you know, the end of the war is starting to dawn on people. So it's still, it's fairly late, which he does with brilliant skill, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The Germans move into Debrecen, shut my father's school down. He's sent back to his town in Tornola. At that point, the conditions become catastrophic for Jews. His father's business is stripped away from him. Um, they're forced to sign over to the Hungarian forces um, all of their property. Um, and in April, early April 1944, um, all the Jews in Tornola are sent into a ghetto, including my father. Um, and, and it's a very small area next to a railroad track where families are stuffed into one room. So essentially, his family with his brother, mother, and father are sent into one room. A, a house may have three or four rooms. There are three or four families in there. And these ghettos are set up, and this is the Germans kind of coming in, organizing the Hungarian effort, principally for two reasons. One is, when you study the Holocaust and realize the amount of people that are getting shipped into the death camps, it is a major logistical issue involving the railroads. And so you have to... Oh, yeah, Hitler denied the war fighters the use of the railroads to prefer sending the Jews off to the camps. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. So you need the logistical aspect of going from a small town, collecting the Jews, moving them into a, mid a bigger town, getting them into Auschwitz, Treblinka, wherever, and that's a major logistical issue. The second reason is it's the final point where you're able to strip the Jews of any, any uh, material goods they have. And so what happens is in the ghetto... Uh, so the ghetto is by the train track. Surrounding it are Hungarian soldiers with machine guns. A Hungarian will walk in and say, Brian Cunningham, and Brian Cunningham would come out. They'd then take him out and say, you signed over your business, but we understand you have more goods to give us, and you haven't given us that. Maybe the person tried to hide some of their wealth. And so the local population is now pointing out Jews that they think have more money that may not have been able, may not have given over when, when the Germans are insisting, or excuse me, when the Hungarians are insisting everything gets paid out. And when the person denies it, what they do is either beat the person up or torture them until they're willing to sign anything. And when they're done, they throw the person back into the ghetto, uh, bloodied up, tortured, whatever. And so my, my... Probably sends a message to the next person. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and so what happens is this is going on, so you're st whatever they didn't get, voluntarily or through force initially, now they're sort of extracting it before the final step. Um, so he has an uncle. It's a, it's a, he has a very large family. It's about 50 relatives spread around that area um, in, in, in north, now northern Hungary. Um, and uh, an uncle, this happens. He owns a pharmacy in town. He's, he's put back in after being tortured, and he commits suicide. It's that kind of stressful. My father's your, your mother, dad's uncle or your dad's brother? Uncle, my, excuse yeah. me, my uncle. Okay. My, 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 just to show you the kind of stress what people are going through, my father's mother has a nervous breakdown, right? Every, it's just becoming this yeah. untenable situation of people being crammed in to really unbearable type circumstances. Later in April 1944, all the men in the ghetto are called out and lined up. And a Hungarian officer walks up and down the rank. Now the Hungarian army is standing in front of them. And he'll go down the rank saying, you, 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 step out. He avoids older guys, and he avoids people that look sick or not healthy. And the Jews that are selected step out, the men. Everyone else is sent back to the ghetto. He says, you have been recruited to the Hungarian labor service. You will now be in complete control of the Hungarian army. We're going to march out of Tornola. And uh, from here on in, you take our orders from us. Um, the Jews that are selected includes my father, um, again, 16 and a half at that point, and his father, some relatives, and then some townspeople, the Jews there, um, are marched out. His mother and brother are in the ghetto. That's the last time he'll ever see them. As they're walking out of town, the townspeople are lining up, applauding that the Jews are getting marched out. Mm. They then are marched out 25, 30 miles out to a military compound. And, and what it is is 
they're organizing these Jews in labor brigades, what are fact, they call it labor brigades. They're essentially slave labor camps in service of the Hungarian army. And so these brigades are set up by the Hungarian army to use the Jews um, to help them in their war effort. And so this, this training camp consists of three or four of these brigades. Typically, it's 200 Jews or so. They march in. They're lined up. They're giving a couple of speeches about what the expectations are, and they're giving three items. One item is a Hungarian cap from the military with insignia taken off. Another is a yellow armband. Um, they're told to get rid of their... When, when the Nazis came into Hungary, the Jews heretofore didn't have to wear right. armbands with the Star of David. Afterwards, they did. They said, get rid of that. Now you wear the yellow armband and a shovel. And they're told these three things... And, and by the way, they are in their civilian clothes. We're not talking about military clothes. You know, you're, you're in your hoodie and jeans, right? And they're told... And this is April, yeah? Yeah, yeah. April 44. They're told from now on, this is what... You guard this shovel with your life. So then they begin to organize these brigades of Jews. And they're surrounded by, typically during the day and night, 15 Hungarian soldiers with machine guns. Not, none of which, by the way, my father thinks are like the crack Hungarian army. They're <laughs> older guys, right? right? Kind of overweight, probably didn't want to be there. But every occasion right. they like to beat on a Jew in these cases. But what they wind up doing for the next month is hard field labor. So they'll take the brigade, they'll ditch these massive ditches with earth mounds one day. The next day, they got to take all the dirt, put it back. Or they'll go to one side of the camp, have to move these huge boulders to one side, move it back. They build something. One day, have to take it down. This, this kind of routine goes on for a month. And then in, in, in June, early June of 44, they're lined up and they're told, prepare we're leaving. We're leaving now. We're not going to tell you where you're going, but we want you to collect your stuff and get out. They then are put on a freight train and sent into the Transcarpathian Mountains, which is now part of Ukraine, uh, into the Eastern Carpathian Mountains, which at that time is part of Poland, not far from Lviv, actually. And so what the Hungarians are doing in support of the first Hungarian army, uh, which is now positioning itself in the Carpathian Mountains in anticipation of the, uh, the Russians attacking it. Um, and so that's where this brigade gets sent to support that. In, in August of 44, the Russian troops move in. And so you're now in the Carpathian Mountains in, in, with, with Hungarians on one side, Russians on the other, up on the mountain, the, the fighting is sort of being taken place at the top of the mountains. Now, some context in terms of what's going on, and then I'll describe what the Jews are doing there because it's pretty mind-boggling. Um, the strategy that winds up developing there is what, what happens is the Russians take the view of they don't they want to avoid the Carpathian Mountains because it's not conducive to the T-34s, right? right? It's, they it's like a, the big planes. Exactly. Warfare, yeah. They want to move, and, and so they set up these monstrous armies in the north run by Zhukov, and, and Ivan Konyev, and in the south, it's uh, two big armies run by uh, Malinovsky and another uh, Russian general by the name of Telbukin. And the strategy is this, what, what Stalin and Stavka, the general staff, tell the Russians in the Carpathian Mountains is, pin these Hungarians in. We don't want you overrunning them, we just want you pinned. And what we'll do is a pinzer move south. We're, we'll focus on Romania first, and then head our forces as we're taking over Hungary from the north and south, essentially a, a noose, if you will, lock the Hungarians in the army, and then we'll sort of collapse it in. But whatever you do, just keep it pinned there. The Hungarians wind up facing the 4th Ukrainian Front Army led by General Ivan Petrov. And I'll come back because it's a very interesting story we can, we can pick up as to who the political commissar is there. Um, but the role of my father and what happens is the slave laborers, so the armies are now on the mountaintops, right, facing each other, a mile, a mile and a half away. And depending on which mountain range you're talking about, you might have the Hungarians on one ridge of one mountain and a mile, a mile and a half, the Russians are entrenched in their trenches on another ridge. Or it might be the same mountaintop depending on, on 
the topography or a different mountaintop, but it, generally they're about a mile, a mile and a half away from each other set up. And they're all in their trenches. And in between the trenches is no man's land. And so you think about World War I, well, right. there's trench warfare still going mm-hmm. on in World War II. The role of the Jews is they are the, the Jewish brigades are at the bottom of the mountains. And the Jews' job is to supply the frontline forces at the top of the mountain with food, ammunition, and in more cases than not, fortification for the trenches. So what the Jews will do at the bottom is cut the trees down, form these A-frame uh, structures, and then bob wired around. And they have no weapons, right? None. Yeah, None. so if they're ever close to the fight, they're... Well, they're, dead, they're right. going to be in the fight. That's yeah. the amazing thing. Yeah, let's, thing. let's, go, let's go to that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what the role then will be, my father is selected to be part of the unit that brings stuff up and down the mountain. Everybody has their role. And so his job is to take these fortifications up the mountain. They might have five or six peop, you know, people lined up. It's led by a Hungarian soldier. Then they move up to the top of the mountain. When they get to the top of the mountain, they're then now in charge. Put in, the people who are in charge are the frontline soldiers. They leave at 2 o'clock every afternoon. They have to make it at night. And we're talking about trench warfare. So the minute they hit the top, it's, so now it's 8, 9 o'clock, typically it's 7, 8 hours just to get to the top of the mountain. You get to the top of the mountain, you can't say anything. Everything is quiet because they don't want the Russians to hear anything. They sit there now behind the frontline Hungarian troops until they're given the order of what to do. The Hungarian soldier will come to him and say, take the fortification, go out 100 yards into no man's land, mm. and set it up here. It was destroyed. Mm. It's then the Jew's job to take that and go into no man's land and set up the fortifications in front of the Hungarian troops. In no Fully man's exposed land. to enemy fire. Right, exactly. Yeah. So what happens, the, the, the Russians are kind of sensing this and start sending flares up. <laughs> Suddenly, no man's land is, is lit up like, you know, Rockefeller Center with, with a Christmas tree, yeah. right? Not and what you want if you're trying to be stealthy. Exactly. Now, now I want you to envision this. The Russians are on one side, the Hungarians are on other, and you got these <coughs> Jews moving in with fortification into no man's land, and suddenly it's lit up. The minute they heard or even saw something lit up, they immediately hit the deck. Because what the Russians would then do is start to shoot right. in, at, at them and the Hungarians, and then behind them, the Hungarians start shooting back. <laughs> so you've got these Jews. And they're basically out there with wood. Yeah. It's like they're yeah, yeah. In their street clothes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right? Yeah. I mean, it's insane. Having marched up the mountain. Right, exactly. Now it's, you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, and so in one instance, three guys close to my father, mortar hits, kills three guys. And so they have now are, are, are completely dependent on surviving. That's what he does. And he, and he brings the stuff up. After the fighting dies down and hopefully you haven't been hit, you then crawl back to the Hungarian line. Once you make it back to the Hungarian line, the question is, what are you going to bring down the mountain? Right? You brought stuff up. Now as a Jew, what's your job to bring down to the mountain? Now sometimes it's empty ammunition boxes and stuff, but the Hungarians want all of their dead soldiers on top, and it's nasty local fighting. Kind of the trenches yeah. are moving back. It's nasty, yeah. nasty fighting. They want to give all of the dead Hungarian soldiers a proper military burial at the bottom of the mountain. So your job is to take dead Hungarians and bring them down the mountain. Also your captors, dead Hungarians who are your captors, yeah. So he could be sitting there and a Hungarian would say to him, over on the left, 25 yards is a dead body. Go pick it up. Now what happens with dead bodies is they get bloated and stiff. It's not that Uh. easy. And so oftentimes it'd have to be him and somebody else or the, his group bringing the dead bodies down to, the, to about, down to the bottom of the mountain where the camp is. So this routine develops. You leave at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. You make it when it's dark. You're there. You're setting, helping up set fortifications. Then you're bringing stuff down, oftentimes dead bodies. You come down to the mountain. You wind up coming back at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning. You spend the next hour cleaning yourself from ticks and, and, and lice, because that's a major issue at the point, and you're infested at this point with lice. Also in my hotel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. 
And this goes on. And so my father said, you know, most armies in the world, even today, use donkeys to do this. Uh, Hungarians were using Jews to do this. So let me ask you this, Nair. What was the attrition rate? So he goes in. Yeah. He's got his, you know, not, I guess, war buddies. How, how, what's the survival yeah. rate? There are approximately 45,000 Jews that are, that are uh, taken into the Hungarian labor service and sent to the front, like my father. 80% of them died. Oy. So I'm, so I'm sure at some point your dad decides, I'm either going to die here on this hill or I'm out. Well, right? this and is the this Yeah, and so this is how the story sort of develops. What happens is the Hungarians now see in the south the Russians coming in. They're sensing that the noose is closing up around them in the Carpathian Mountains, and they decide to leave. And it's a very disorganized march out. And so they're, they're leaving now or trying to get out of the Carpathian Mountains and that range into... Slovakia, Hungary, that area. I'm sure they're very concerned about the welfare of their Jewish very concerned, uh, yeah, very comrades. Concerned, right, very concerned. They start acting extremely erratic. Now, now the reality is they're not particularly nice to the Jews up to that point, but they tolerate them, and there's occasional cruelty. As, hung, as the situation with Hungary starts to fall apart, the soldiers increasingly get more and more erratic, right. more and more cruel towards the Jews. In one march, a, a Hungarian soldier yells, at the group my father's with, throws a grenade, three people he knew from Tornola dies. Um, but there's an interesting psychological aspect to this story as it relates to my father. My father, from a very young time in 43, came to the conclusion that he had to make it into the Russians' hands to survive. Right. Right? The only way as a Jew you were going to survive is somehow making it into the Russians. As the Hungarians are pulling out from the front, the sound of the front becomes more and more faded. And he starts getting very panicky. Because now he's further away from exactly. the Russians. Exactly. The whole time he he's thinks hoping, they're safety. Yeah. yeah, he's hoping that they're going to break through. And so he decides he's got it. This is it. He can't continue with things are getting erratic, disorganized, cruelty, whatever. They march, the, uh, march his group into what is Slovakia, right on the border of now Slovakia, Hungary. And they move him in one night into an enclosed area. And, and one thing my father was very good at was very attuned to the guards and the situations he was under. So he could still, to this day, even can describe to you in great detail the guards and who they were and the differences. And he senses a time that he can get out. So they're in a camp, enclosed camp. The, the gate is facing west. They're being marched westward now through what looks like Away Slovakia. from the Russians. Away yeah. from the Russians as the Russians are moving in. He goes up to one of the, the guard who's there, and the guy's half asleep. He looks like he's some middle-aged guy that would rather be with his family, doesn't want to be Again, there. Again, these are not the crack troops. Well, yeah, but there are still... And they're armed, they're, they're, and they're, they're cruel. Yeah, they're, but, they're, but they're the guys that are now fighting, right? These are infantry-type guys. But he says to the guy, look, he goes, they used to call him Uncle, Uncle, right? The <laughs> nicknames for the, for the guards are watching. They say, hey, Uncle. He goes, I have a... I've been shitting, diarrhea, it's terrible. Let me get out of this camp. Let me just take a shit. I'll be right back. The guy lets him out of the enclosed camp, and my father takes off. He heads south, and then he figures he wants to get back to the Russians and starts heading east again in that direction where he came from. Sort of through the battle, right? So he's going... Well, yeah, what's happening, yeah. right. The forces are flowing west. Right. The Russians are moving west, and he's kind of like a fish moving... In the, right, the right, right, like swimming right. upstream, exactly. yeah. Exactly. On December 12th, he makes it into a town called Bisht um, and starts fine. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a village area right on the border of what now is Ukraine, Slovakia. And uh, then asks one of the, the peasants there if he could do some husbandry work for him and if the guy could feed him. So now he's got to figure out how to eat. And the guy agrees to let him sleep in a barn and just take care of some animals. And I just want to say something interesting about my father's experience. Um, He's forced, he comes from a fairly prosperous family and at a very young age is forced now in these circumstances to have to beg for food or more likely trade some work to get fed. Um, and, his ob and, and through his entire experience in World War II, what he says is, what he told me was, you go to the poorest people, mm. the guy that had a pig and nothing else, mm -hmm. and they would give you bread. Right. You go to a person that had money or any sense of, well-being, yep. they wouldn't give you shit. They tell you to get lost. Yeah. And that human characteristic was I found very interesting. Yeah, yeah. He mentions that. Still true. Yeah. On December twelfth, uh, December sixteenth, excuse me, 
which will forever in his life be called his Liberation Day, the Russians march into Bisht. Um, and for the first time, he sees American Jeeps. Never, mm. Now remember, nobody, Germans, the, nobody has Jeeps. Mm -hmm. The Americans give, I think, the, the oh, Russians yeah. 100,000 Jeeps yeah, yeah. or something. So the Russians are, mar are, are driving forward in Jeeps with carpets on it. So my father always thought, every Jeep has a carpet in it. <laughs> <laughs> So they collect all the people in the village. And they want to interrogate them for security purposes. Once sort of the, the troops come through, they're, again, they're marching kind of westward. And they interview, they bring my father in. It's, it's, a, it's a couple of uh, Russian soldiers. They're not communicating well. Um, the Russians are speaking Russian. He's trying to speak a little bit broken, Slavic. They really don't understand him. And they start interrogating him, asking him, you know, what... Who are you? What, what, what is your role? Again, they're looking at this guy with blonde hair, whatever. Right. He does a fatal mistake. He tells them, or tries to tell them, that he was the truth, which was he was a Jew in a, in a Hungarian labor service. He has a connection to Slovakia. They don't really hear that. What they hear is Hungarian army. They walk away. They come back and arrest him. And he realizes kind of the, the, the fatal mistake he made. They then march him and about six <laughs> other guys out of that town. His presumed saviors are now his captains. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and they march him another 30 miles. And they dump him in a camp, a POW camp, full of German and Hungarian soldiers. And you could always tell who was who there because right. the Hungarians wore green uniforms. The Germans had sort of gray uniforms. The Russians had these brown uniforms. My father is in street clothes. And they throw him <laughs> into, into, into this camp. Three or four days later, they start marching this camp out, and, and, and the Russian troops, the Russians would start, start marching throughout east. What the Russians were doing was they were using Cossacks on horseback, in these cases small ponies, to march the, the, the military line into Russia. So suddenly they start marching this group of POW camp, uh, Russians, excuse me, Germans and Hungarians, into Ukraine, north of Ushharad, which so if you know on the map now, if you're looking at the conflict, this is the westernmost portion now of Ukraine. Almost to so, Poland or... Yeah, yeah, they're north of it. And, and so they're moving all these troops into the interior of Russia, probably never to be seen again, as many of, of the German troops would, you know, would never be seen again once they go into Russia. Three days into it. And he's noticing that the Cossacks really are not that security conscious in the sense that there are gaps that are appearing in the line you know, uh, one horse, one guy on a pony might be 50 yards ahead. So, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, though, because we've talked in the past. <clears throat> Alex has made the point about how in a prison situation, the inmates are always completely methodically focused on every single bit of procedure and bureaucracy and routine of the guards because this is their only chance, right? Exactly right. Yeah. No, and he was he was really good at that from that yeah. standpoint. So how so how does he get out then? Let's let's go to yeah, that. Yeah, he's in the vill They're in a village. The, the 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 line, the POW line, makes a sharp right. He says, "This is my chance," and he jumps behind a shed into a ditch. There's a ditch on the road. Jumping in, thinking he's alone, he lands on top of another Hungarian Ugh. soldier that was escaping. <laughs> The guy says, get the fuck out of here. And my father says, shut this up. This is my hidey hole. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, what are you doing here? Get out of here, right? Eventually, they, he, my father says, shut up. You know, just keep quiet. The line eventually works its way gone. They stand up, and they decide to go their separate way. My father really doesn't know at that point where to go. He's now in what is now Ukraine, north of Ushra Harad. So um, it's, it's his second escape. Now he's alone, wanted by both sides in the middle of World War II. Yeah, and, and, and at this point, he really doesn't know what to do, so he decides not to head west. He heads west. Again, the issue of where can he eat comes up, and he winds up coming into the rear guard of the 4th Ukrainian Army, Russian Army, where there is a military mess camp, where the guys are cooking food for, for the troops. Right. And he comes in, he talks to them, and, and they say, yeah, well, do he asks for food. They say, cut some potatoes, and they feed him. So for a couple of days, he winds up cutting potatoes for the Russian army, kind of the, the cooks in, in, in the backwater you know, kitchen that they're making. That would have food. definitely been my role if I was ever in the military. <laughs> it's called KP duty. I think. <laughs> As the Russians are moving west now, they want to get rid of all these vagabonds. You, you know, when these armies move, there are a lot of people that are attaching to it and stuff like that. 
So they get my father and a group of people that are kind of hanging on around there, and they bring him into a tent in front of an NKVD officer. And NKV is the Russian secret. It's now the KG, It's now the, it became the KGB, and now it's the FSB, SBR, SVR. Yeah. It's the it's Smirsh from uh, James Bond. Exactly. Now, interesting thing about the NKVD and the way Stalin organized his army, and this is the interesting tie-in that I mentioned earlier about the 4th Ukrainian Front Army. It's not one of the glorious Russian armies. It's a rear guard yeah. army. It goes through, eventually makes its way into Prague, but it's not one of the, the major Russian armies. Um, Stalin always appoints a political commissar to be parallel <laughs> with the general in charge of the army, and they do that to control the soldiers, to make sure they don't stray from the... the communist dogma. So there's nothing like fighting Nazis all day and at the end sitting around a campfire reading the works of Lenin and, 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 and Stalin. Well, and, Stalin and this year, 2022, reportedly Vladimir Putin put those commissars back in the units. They had yeah. been stripped of the Russian yeah, yeah, yeah. army for uh, quite a long time well, and now they're back. Yeah, and in Russian army what the NKV does also is they within the re- armies they're setting up rear guard forces so that if any Russian soldier decides they want to split, they get killed. And so in Stalingrad there are these famous scenes where right. where once you hit the western shore you have 30 minutes to live. That was literally the, the lifespan of a Russian marine in Stalingrad, you either run directly into the German nest in Stalingrad mm-hmm. or turn around and run into the Russian NKVD units, which are lined up in the shore of the Volga River that are going to mow you down. So it's one way to keep the discipline. It's a kamikaze discipline. Mission, Right, one yeah. way to keep the discipline. But uh, at least, unlike in China, they don't charge you for the bullet they use. <laughs> exactly. Now, what's interesting about the political commissar of the 4th Ukrainian Front Army that my father winds up fighting against and then eventually escapes into is that it's a young Leonid Brezhnev. He's 38 years old. Leonid Brezhnev is Ukrainian. His mentor is Nikita Khrushchev, who is... Also Ukrainian. Also, yeah, well, he's born in Russia, but very close to Ukraine, but is one of uh, of Stalin's protégés, is a butcher uh, of unbelievable proportions in Ukraine and Moscow. Together, these two Ukrainians rule Russia from 1953 to 1982. Um, and so one lesson for today is they want it back. And they don't only want it back from that time period, they want it back from the time when the czars had it right, too. Right. But let's let's get to how your dad escapes and get out of Europe and then the next chapter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, eventually makes it into, gets kicked out. He, he, the the NKVD officer tells him to get lost. He makes it into Uzharad Uz at that point. Uh, gets you right. know, in my career, a lot of spies told me to get lost, but they were all on our side, so it wasn't exactly <laughs> the same. Um, and eventually makes it back to his town in Tornola. This is ni- now this is 45, in April 45, um, and he decides, now I can get back to my town in Tornola. At this point, he has no idea what's happened to his family, his military unit, nothing. Makes his way back to Tornola. Tornola at that point is filled with Russian troops, he goes to his house. The Russians have turned it into a sheep shed. Um, what the Russians used to do is they used to come into towns that they conquered and say the local population, where the Nazis live, and then find those houses and then move an- the animals that were supporting the troops. The house is destroyed in 10 minutes, right? Once you move the animals in, they pointed out the, this Jew's house, they moved it in there. But there are no Jews there. They're right. all non-Jews right, right. and Russian soldiers. The next day or two, and now they're hearing stories about what's happening with, with the Jews in Eastern Europe, but they're not, it's not exactly clear to them. The next day or two, a couple of other guys his age come back, Jews that he knew before the war, they kind of stumble in, but no Jew returns. And then what happens is in July of 44, a cousin of his who somehow survives uh, Auschwitz comes back. And, and, the sto- and then the, he finds out that, that they took all the, the people in the ghetto, um, put them on trains, and then sent them to Auschwitz. And this is the first time he really knows what's happened yeah, to his whole extended clear, his, family. His family. And that included his, his mother, brother, they're sent to the gas chamber, including all of his relatives. His father has a different experience. His father peels off when they're up in the mountains fighting the Russians and, and gets ill and winds up in another um, labor service group that has a lot of doctors and dentists and stuff. 
and is north of Lake Ballaton towards the end of the war. Lake that that area, if, if you know it, serves as the final kind of battle between the Germans and and the Russians, a big tank battle. As the Germans are falling back with their Hungarian sympathizers, they come into a town of 400 Jews, including his father, and they do what <laughs> Hungarians and Germans do. They tie him up, take him outside, and shoot him all in the head and yes. throw him in a pit. His labor unit, unit is, is, is walk through Slovakia, and around Austria is handed off to the Germans. The Germans, they take that group of guys into Austria, work them hard. When they're done with them, they send them all to Malthausen concentration camp and get rid of them. So it's now May. The, the war ends in May of 44, and my father at that point, born in 27, is 17 yeah. years old. But that's not his last escape. No, no. So now he's all alone. He, and, and what do you do? At that point, the Iron Curtain starts to descend on Europe. Churchill gives his famous speech in Fulton, Missouri, talking about the Iron Curtain falling in. And my father, there's not, he's not doing much. It's 46 now, actually, after the war. He's hanging around. The Russian troops use him to set up a monument in the town, Slowly but surely, the anti-Semitism starts to creep back. And signs from the kind of, Russians? Well, from the local population, uh. actually, the Slavics. The Slavics would put up a sign saying, Czechs to Prague, Russians to Russia, Jews to Palestine. Or hmm. in, in Poland, there actually pogroms start occurring again after the war. My father decides he has no future here. Again, he has no property. Everything's been stripped All his away. family's gone. Everybody's dead, right? And so at that time, the question is, where do you go? How do you get away from the Russians that are now starting to shut all the borders down and stuff? Um, there's a Zionist movement going on throughout Europe where Zionists are trying to collect Jews to get them to what is then Palestine. Palestine at that point is a British mandate from World War I. Um, and in um, early 47, January 47, he gets on a, a train that's sponsored by the Zionist group. And what they're doing is bribing the Russian army through to get these Jews into Western Europe. Eventually, the train makes it into a displacement camp outside of Brussels, Belgium. And, and all, the, all the Jews on the train are then dumped into this uh, displa personal, personal displacement camp. It's a good thing to know. One thing remains consistent with the Russians across the centuries, bribery. Bribery always works. Yeah. <laughs> so then what's happening is it's now... Late March 47, the, the, everybody in his camp said, all right, get on a train. And they're shipped down to set France. What's happening is the Zionists are trying to smuggle illegal immigrants into Palestine at that time. The British forces are set up to block the immigration of Jews into Palestine. And he's put on a ship called the Theodor Herzl. The Theodor Herzl is named after the founder of Zionism. And there are about 2,600 other Holocaust survivors on this ship, all very young, by the way. You, what you find quickly is that whoever survived the Holocaust right. was, you know, young and tough, teen yeah. and 20s, and everybody else is pretty much dead. And so the ship takes off. It somehow manages to avoid British reconnaissance planes. It makes it all the way to the coast of what is then Palestine 13 days later, where it's then intercepted by two British. Uh, corvettes, uh, warships, warships yeah. essentially. Um, the war, the, and this is a fairly famous story. The warships stop the Theodor Herzl. It's right by Herzliya, Israel, which is north of now Tel Aviv. And the troops there board, have to board the Theodor Herzl. There's some problem. They don't get the exact number of troops on. It's like seven guys. The Jews there start acting up, throw one of the sailors that boards the ship into the, into the ocean. The British start shooting. Three of these immigrants die, including a friend of my father's. And then everything calms down at that point. They then tow the Theodore Herzl up <laughs> to Haifa. And then they split the two groups in, into two parts. There's the about, about 1,600 or so of, of the people get sent to camps in Palestine and then 800, including my father, are put on British warships and sent to Cyprus. What the British were doing, now Cyprus at that point is a, is a colony of Britain. Palestine isn't. It's a mandate that they're just supervising on behalf of 
of the UN. What they were doing is setting up displacement camps in Cyprus. As they were catching these Jews trying to make it illegally into Palestine, they would then send the Jews into these camps in Cyprus. And there were two main areas. His area, he got sent to Camp Number 68. If you know Cyprus, it's in the southeast. It's, it's Larnaca Bay on the east side. So it's fairly close to Larnaca. Um, and for the survivors of the concentration camps, it's a fairly traumatic experience. Suddenly you're back into camps with guards. Yeah, you thought Arnica. you're done with all that. Yeah. yeah, you have no idea what yeah. the future is, right? Yeah. Israel's not around, whatever. Yeah. My father, on the other hand, thinks it's great. <laughs> the British treat him like he calls them gentlemen. He has no issues with the guards there at all. They're very nice guys. He goes around the camp. They used to call him Tommy. So every British soldier, Tommy, Tommy, throw me a cigarette, throw me a cigarette. And within three or four days, him and a couple of his mates, Hungarian, who's friends with, start analyzing the layout of the camp and, and how it's set up. And again, the guards and the security system. And what they notice is that the guard, the watchtowers, they've got spotlights going back and forth. There's sort of an an area, maybe call it 15, 20 yards, directly in front of the guard towers where the searchlights don't make it in. And they notice one guard tower has some fence damage behind it. So my father at some point decides it's time for him to do a little sightseeing around Cyprus (laughs) and crawls on his belly in this kind of zone and then under the guard tower and through this broken fence, eventually makes it to Larnaca, walks around Larnaca, and then sits on a park bench, and suddenly two British military police walk up to him and say, show us your identification. Pretty quickly they realize they're, they're dealing with a person who escaped from one of their internment camps, and they throw him in jail with a group of Turkish prisoners. A week or two goes by, he gets called into a British court. There's a British judge there. His name is Cox, by the way. He still remembers the name. Mm. The judge looks at him and says, you've entered Cyprus illegally. My father says, what are you talking about? You brought me here (laughs) illegally. He says, no, no, no. Those camps are not part of Cyprus. What you did was enter Cyprus. Throws him back in jail where he spends the next month with these Turkish prisoners. Eventually gets thrown back into Camp 68. It's now July 15, 1948. And he's now put on a ship and now sent to what is Israel. Um, Israel declares its independence in May of 15th. The British have said, we've had enough. They throw, th- sort of throw the Palestinian problem in the laps of the UN. Um, when he hits the shores of Israel, Israel right now is in the middle of its war of independence. Now, you're talking about an Hungarian guy that doesn't know a word of Hebrew, not particularly Zionistic. Just This was a, his only sort of option. They immediately take him off the ship, line the guys up, and say to them, Look, you have two choices. You can either go to the kibbutz oh, or you can go to the army. Something he's heard before. Yeah. My, these, guys, these, these guys from Europe hear the word kibbutz, they're already nervous. Right? <laughs> what the hell is this thing, right? These camps, I want nothing to do with them. My father says, I'll go to the army, whatever that amounts to, right? As he's talking to the guy who's sort of sorted, listening to my, my father's story, the guy slips out that Israel is now in the process of forming a navy. Israeli Navy at that point is two old frigate ships and like maybe a couple of rowboats, right? There's hardly (laughs) a Navy. But my father sees an out because he said, if it's anything like the war I experienced in Europe, I want nothing to do with it. Well, and he's a highly experienced sailor. Exactly. Well, so so he says to the the guy, well, that's great because I used to sail in Budapest (laughs) on the Danube. And he's recruited into the new Israeli Navy. Now, I take a lot of pride in this story because now, of course, the Israeli Navy is pretty powerful yeah, yeah. and they have probably what are nuclear-tipped submarines and from the Persian Gulf all the way, all through the Mediterranean. But it all started with this mighty sailor from yeah. the Danube, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's the Gilligan yeah. of the Israeli Navy. The story is almost over with the exception of one more arrest. He becomes part of the Israeli Navy. And, and Haifa at that point, and after the war, it's basically sent to a ship in Haifa. And Haifa, then like it is today, is is kind of an important destination point for a lot of navies around the world to to restock, refuel, give their their sailors shore leave and stuff. And he notices that a lot of ships aren't coming into the harbor itself. They're actually out in the bay. And so what he and a couple of his friends do is start a black market. (laughs) They'll load up rowboats. 
full of cigarettes and alcohol and any other contraband they can get their hands on and row it out and start selling it to the sailors on these ships. Well, the Israeli Navy finds out about it, throws him in jail, <laughs> and it, now he's now in an Israeli jail, sort of full circle. So That's Navy jail. How bad could it be? I'll, I'll stop the story there. You've been very gracious, so I oh, appreciate it. It's been amazing to listen to that. Thank you so much. <laughs> So at, at this point, I'm torn because on the one hand, it's it's just a ridiculous story, which we amazing tale of human courage and resilience that we could talk about for hours. On the other hand, we have a lot of people here that are thirsty, need a cocktail, including myself, including you. Yep. Uh, we will definitely have you on again. I want to make a comment, and then I want to turn it over to my partner, Alex. And by the way, I believe this is a world record for Alex Dean not talking. So I'm sure he has some questions and comments. But one thing I wanted to elicit, because I know this is part of your story, how did your dad view his British captors compared to his other captors? Oh, like I said, he thought they were gentlemen. Yeah. So Alex, feel good. I mean, <laughs> hey, look, this was, not the, this was nothing like the camps they were in and out of Eastern Europe, right? It was, it was displacement camps. It, it was unple- certainly if you had made it through a concentration camp. But for a guy like my father, you know, he could sculpt. He learned how to, a love of sculpting. And he's, he's yeah, started. so give us a, a quick uh, version of what, what he, so he made it to America, obviously, had a great Offspring or, yeah. or two, um, and uh, but what is what did he do with his life after he made it to America? Well, what he did with his life is in Israel at that point. After he gets out of the Navy, Israel starts a, univer- un- a new university called Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and they start a medical school. He had family that uh, were doctors, and he said, "Hey, this would be kind of interesting." And so a friend of his said, "You should apply, become a doctor." The only hitch was uh-huh. they required that you be a, a, grad- a high school graduate. <laughs> Now, I won't say how he managed to say his last <laughs> graduate, but let's just say it's good to know people in the black market that can forge, you know, papers and stuff. He goes to he goes to medical school in Israel, and and the, the, the switch to the U.S. is he, he does a bunch of different things, including taking care of a leper colony in Jerusalem, fights in the fifty six war as a doctor in the sixty seven war. Um, he's put in charge. He eventually winds up as a psychiatrist. Winds up in charge of a mental institution in <coughs> Jerusalem that has a bunch of Holocaust women survivors in it. And at that time, the theory of psychiatrist medicine was that schizophrenic women could calm down and get better if they got pregnant. Okay. And this is medical theory, right? My father thinks this is total bullshit. By the way, this is completely inconsistent with my experience in my entire yeah. life. <laughs> anyway, he, he, he thinks this is bullshit. He hooks up with a, um, with a statistician. They do a study. They send it to the British Journal of Psychiatry. The thing is published, and suddenly, you know, this this guy who's now what's called 40, 67, um, is offered a fellowship after it's uh, at Columbia University, and kind of that's how he made it to New York. And then uh, was a psychiatrist. Too. Well, first of all, thank you so much for sharing that with us. I know I know it has never been shared in public before. So we really appreciate that you did it on our podcast. I'm going to turn this over to Alex. I just want to say one more thing. Uh, and it's a personal thing. Uh, you and I have known each other for, we, we were screwing around with the math earlier. It might be 30 years, might be 40 years, I don't know. Um, amazing story of heroism and the human spirit and inventiveness and capability and perseverance. I know you're, one of your two great sons is here. And I just want to say, having raised two kids of my own who are wonderful, not all the heroes uh, escaped from prison in World War II. Yeah. That's for sure. Thank you. Thanks, man. Final thoughts, questions? I, I have no questions. It's been a privilege to listen to that, and I think that that's a sentiment shared by us all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man.